Hi everybody, I'm going to be reading The Omnivore's Dilemma, Young Reader's Edition, Chapter 17, starting on page 224. My Grass-Fed Meal Before I left the farm Friday, I gathered together the makings for that evening's dinner. I had originally thought about filling a cooler with polyface meat and bringing it home with me to California to cook there. But after all of Joel's talks about eating locally in short food chains, that didn't seem right. So I decided to cook dinner for a few old friends who lived close by in Charlottesville. We would eat the food within a short drive of the farm where it had been grown. From the farm's walk-in cooler, I picked out two of the chickens we had slaughtered on Wednesday. I also took a dozen of the eggs I'd helped gather Thursday evening. Then I stopped by the hoop house and harvested a dozen ears of sweet corn. Joel refused to accept payment for the food, calling it my pay for the week's work. On the way into Charlottesville, I stopped to pick up a few other items. I tried as best as I could to look for local produce. As much as possible, I wanted this meal to be barcode free. For my salad, I found some nice looking locally grown arugula. At the wine shop, I found a short shelf of Virginia wines, but here I hesitated. Virginia is known for many things, but wine isn't one of them. Did buying local have to include the wine too? I hadn't had a sip of wine all week and was really looking forward to it. Then I spotted a wine for 25 bucks, an awful lot for a bottle from an area not generally known for its wines. I decided the winemakers must have been confident it was good, so I added the bottle to my cart. I also needed some chocolate for dessert. The state of Virginia produces no chocolate to speak of. Since there was no local product, I was free to go for the good Belgian stuff. I did it without guilt, since even the most extreme eat local types say it's okay to buy goods that can't be produced locally. That meant coffee, tea, sugar, and chocolate. We're safe. Whew. During the week, I'd given some thought to what I should make. Working backwards, I knew I wanted to make a dessert that would feature polyface eggs. All those chefs had said the eggs were magical, so I decided to try something that calls for a bit of magic, a chocolate souffle. For a side dish, sweet corn was a no-brainer. No one had tasted corn yet this year, but what meat to serve? Because it was only June, Polyface had no fresh beef or pork or turkey. Joel wouldn't begin slaughtering cattle and turkeys till later in the summer. He wouldn't get to the hogs until the fall. There was frozen beef and pork, but it was last season's. I wanted to make something fresh. Rabbit seemed risky. I had no idea whether my friends Mark and Liz liked it or if their boys would want to eat bunny. So that left chicken, which truth to tell, left me feeling a little queasy. Was I gonna be able to enjoy chicken so soon after working in the processing shed and gut composting pile? I was about to find out. When I got to Mark and Liz's house, there were still several hours before dinner. I had decided to brine the chicken. A soak in saltwater brine causes meat to absorb moisture and breaks down the proteins that can toughen it on the grill. My plan was to slow roast the chicken pieces on a wood fire, and this would keep the chicken from drying out. So I cut each of the two birds into eight pieces and put them in a bath of water, kosher salt, sugar, a bay leaf, a splash of soy sauce, a garlic clove, and a small handful of peppercorns and coriander seeds. To be honest, there was another reason I chose the brining and grilling method. Once the chickens were cut into pieces, they wouldn't look quite so much like birds I had helped kill and gut on the farm. Soaking them in brine would change their taste and aroma. That would help cancel out the scents I remembered from the processing shed. Cooking changes the animals we eat and gives us some distance from the reality of the slaughterhouse. In the same way, when we buy a package of hamburger at a supermarket, we rarely think of the living cow. There are, of course, those who prefer their fish, poultry, or pork served with the head still on. After soaking them in the brine for a few hours, I removed and rinsed the chicken pieces. Then I spread them out to dry for an hour or two. Drier skin would brown and get crispy on the grill. Mark and Liz had a gas barbecue, but I wanted some smoke and flavor of a wood fire. I snipped a couple of twigs off their apple tree and stripped off the leaves. Then I placed the twigs on top of the grill where the green wood would smolder rather than burn. 
I turn the gas down low and after rubbing a little olive oil on the chicken pieces, arrange them on the grill among the apple branches. While the chicken roasted slowly outside, I got to work in the kitchen preparing the souffle. I was assisted by Willie, Mark, and Liz's 12-year-old son. Li Willie melted the chocolate in a saucepan, and I separated the egg whites from the yolks. The yolks were a gorgeous, carroty shade of orange. They were so firm that separating them from the whites was easy. After adding a pinch of salt, I began beating the egg whites. Beating whites makes them turn white and stiff. That's when you begin adding sugar and turn the beater on high. The beater forms billions of microscopic air pockets and stiffens the egg proteins. A souffle grows in the oven because the heat causes these air pockets to expand. At least, that's the way it's supposed to work. The egg whites doubled in size, then doubled again. Once they formed into stiff, snowy peaks, they were ready. Willie had already blended the yolks into his melted chocolate. Now we gently folded my egg whites into the thick syrup, then poured the airy, toast-colored mixture into a souffle dish and put it aside. Willie and I brought the corn out on the deck to shuck. The ears were so fresh that the husks squealed as you peeled them back. I explained to Willie that the corn had grown in a deep bed of composted chicken manure. That was probably not the sort of detail you'd want to mention on a menu. Polyface corn a la chicken crap? But Willie agreed there was something pretty neat about it. I also told him that the variety of corn we were eating was called Golden Bantam. It dates back over a hundred years before all corn was just corn. Today's hybrid corn is bred to keep its sweetness over long distance transport. At the same time, that breeding has made it, lost, made it lose a lot of its earthy corn flavor. Our corn had been picked that morning, just a short drive away. Since it didn't have to stand up to the stress of a cross country trip, we were able to enjoy this corn the way it was supposed to taste. I had pretty much this same meal several times before. The list of ingredients looked the same, yet I knew this wasn't the same food at all. That was because the chickens had spent their lives outdoors on pastures rather than in a shed eating grain. When cattle, chickens, and other animals eat grass, and not just corn or other grains, they are actually healthier for us to eat. So is the milk or eggs that come from grass-fed animals. This is no accident. Humans evolved to eat meat from wild animals, animals that ate little or no grain. Animals raised outdoors on grass have a diet much more like that of the wild animals. It makes sense that their meat, milk, and eggs would be better for us. Green grass has large quantities of beta carotene, vitamin E, and folic acid. These natural chemicals are important for a healthy diet. Animals that eat grass have high levels of these and other important nutrients. It's the beta carotene that gives the polyface egg yolks their carroty color. Animals raised in pastures have less fat than grain-fed animals. Part of this is because pasture-fed animals get exercise. Not only that, but the kind of fats in pastured animals are the ones that are healthier for us to eat. For example, they have higher levels of polyunsaturated fats instead of monounsaturated fats. They also contain more omega-3s. These are essential fatty acids and they are very important for human health. Among other things, omega-3s are important for the growth of brain cells and other neurons. Omega-6 is another fatty acid essential to humans. Our bodies need both of these and they need them in the right balance. Omega-3s are made in the leaves of plants. Omega-6s are made in the seeds. There's a lot of evidence that a healthy diet has a pretty even balance of omega-3 and omega-6. And that's exactly the balance in the meat of wild animals. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Human beings evolved to survive and be healthy on a diet of wild meat and plants. Now go one step further. The meat of grass-fed cows also has the same healthy balance of omega-3 and omega-6. Why? because grass-fed cows are eating the same diet as their wild ancestors. It turns out that corn-fed cows don't have the healthy balance of omegas. Their meat has a ratio of about 14 omega-6 to 1 omega-3. 
Some scientists think this imbalance might help explain the high levels of heart disease in our society. In other words, it's not eating meat so much as eating corn-fed meat that is bad for us. The point is that all beef is not the same. All salmon is not the same. All eggs are not created equal. The type of animal you eat may matter less than what the animal you're eating has itself eaten. Once shoppers know this, they begin to look at food costs differently. Poly Farms eggs at $2.20 a dozen might be a better deal than supermarket eggs at 79 cents a dozen. Polyface grass-fed chickens produce eggs with more omega-3s, beta-carotene, and vitamin E. And they do it in a way that's better for the environment. Doesn't that sound like a bargain? Okay, so a pastured chicken might be better for you, but how different does it actually taste? It certainly smelled wonderful when I raised the lid on the barbecue to put the corn on. The chicken was browning nicely, the skin was beginning to crisp and take on the toasty tones of oiled wood. The corn, on which I'd rubbed some olive oil and sprinkled salt and pepper, would take only a few minutes. All it needed was to heat up and for a scattering of kernels to brown. While the corn finished roasting, I removed the chicken from the grill and set it aside to rest. A few minutes later, I called everyone to the table. Ordinarily, I might have felt a little funny hosting a dinner in someone else's home. But Mark and Liz are such close friends, it seems perfectly natural to be cooking for them. That's not to say I didn't feel the cook's usual worries about whether everything would come out right. Liz is a great cook, too, so I was anxious to measure up. I passed the platters of chicken and corn and proposed a toast. I offered thanks first to my hosts, who were also my guests, and then to Joel Salatin and his family for growing the food before us and for giving it to us, and then finally to the chickens, who in one way or another had provided just about everything we were about to eat. This was my non-religious version of grace, I suppose. We dug in, and as usually happens during a good meal, there was little talking at first, just a few murmurs of satisfaction. I don't mind saying the chicken was out of this world. The skin had turned the color of mahogany and the texture of parchment. The meat itself was moist, dense, and almost shockingly flavorful. I could taste the brine and applewood, of course, but even more important, the chicken held its own against those strong flavors. This may not sound like much of a compliment, but to me, the chicken smelled and tasted exactly like chicken. Liz agreed, saying it was a more chickeny chicken. What accounted for it? I know what Joel would have said. When chickens get to live like chickens, they'll taste like chickens too. Everyone was curious to hear about the farm, especially after tasting the food that had come off it. Liz and Mark's older son, Matthew, who is 15, asked a lot of questions about killing chickens. He's currently a vegetarian and would only eat the corn. I didn't think it was wise to go into detail at the dinner table, but I did talk about my week on the farm, about the Salatins and their animals. I explained the circle of chickens and cows and pigs and grass. I managed to avoid the details of manure and grubs and composted guts. Slowly, the conversation drifted off from my adventures as a farmhand. We talked about Willie's songwriting. He is, mark my words, the next Bob Dylan. Matthew's summer football camp. Mark and Liz's writing, school, politics, the war in Iraq, and on and on. Being a Friday late in June, this was one of the longest evenings of the year, so no one felt in a rush to finish. Besides, I just put the souffle into bake when we sat down so dessert was still a ways off. While we talked and waited for the souffle to complete its magic rise, the smell of baking chocolate seeped out of the kitchen and filled the house. Though I had avoided talking about it, my mind went to the long chain from manure to grass to cow to grubs to chicken to eggs. The chain didn't stop there, for I had turned the eggs into something else. At least, I hoped I had. When at last I told Willie the time had come to open the oven and cross your fingers, I saw his smile blossom first, then the great crown of souffle puffing out from the cinched white waist of its dish. Triumph. 
There's something amazing about any souffle, how a half dozen eggs, flavored by nothing more than sugar and chocolate, can turn into something so air-like. Souffle, to blow, comes from the Latin word for breath. When done right, it's more like a breath of food rather than something solid. This particular souffle was good, not great. Its texture was slightly grainier than it should have been, which makes me think I may have beaten the egg whites a little too long. But it tasted wonderful, everyone agreed. And as I rolled the rich yet weightless confection on my tongue, I closed my eyes and suddenly there they were. Joel's hens, marching down the gangplank from out of their eggmobile, fanning out across the early morning pasture, there in the grass where this magical bite began.